Many thanks for being with us this morning. We're looking at a second conversation, and this point we're, we're looking at the issue of or thefts and vandalism, pipeline vandalism uh, that has affected, you know, uh, output production. But, however, the surveillance outfit of ex-militant leader government Ekbe Polo, alias Tom Polo, have discovered major tapping points in the trans Focados Ramos pipeline in Delta State, through which international oil companies and security officials, oil bunkers and locals have colluded to bleed the country over the years. Tom Polo discovered the breaches after the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited NNPCL awarded him a pipeline surveillance contract, but he took time to investigate to find out those uh, penetrating the act or perpetuating the act. The findings, according to reports, are that it's a top secret information for the chief of defense staff, that's the CDS, and who is General Lucky Rabo, the group managing director of Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited, NNPCL, Alaji Melia Kiari, both of who flew in from Abuja at the time to Delta State to inspect several. Uh, violations. The NNPCL and security officials counted 16 breaches on the pipeline operated by Shell Petroleum Development Company at the Yokuri community and its environs in Delta State. The pipeline runs from Otumara and ends at Forkado's terminal and all thefts. Oil companies and security officials have actually siphoned you know, the products, which has left the country bleeding. The story is almost endless, but let's have our guest join us this morning to share his thoughts. Ola Bode Shomi, oil and gas expert. He joins us all the way from Abuja. Thank you so much, Shomi, for being part of the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, Good morning. Happy holidays. H Happy holiday to you. If you can hear me loud and cloud, I'd like to, uh, Claire, really, I'd like to share your thoughts. Okay, um, thank you. I think uh, you have very articulately spelled out the problem in terms of what is happening there. But what you may not have alluded to and what everybody knows is that these things are not totally new. I mean, you don't need to be in the industry for somebody to let you know that there's oil theft. The issue has always been that has anybody ever been held accountable for these things? So we need to understand that in life, even with children, when there are no consequences to wrongdoing, people are encouraged to do it. So the issue is not so much as the revelation of the theft or the extent of the theft or the amount of criminality that goes on, but the issue is that the people, the system, the coordination that ensured that Nigeria is shortchanged and suffering as a result of this, should there be consequences to it? That is what we should be talking about. So if the Navy were involved, the Navy naval officers who were involved should have consequences. If the NMPC officials were involved, the NMPC officials who were involved should have consequences to these actions. If there were people in other departments that were involved, there should be some kind of consequences so that that can serve as a deterrent in future. Because if nothing happened, trust me, in the next one or two years, you will have another set of hungry, aggressive people who will do similar things or attempt to do similar things because they know that at the end of the day, there will be no consequences. All developed nations we talk about, they are developed, there is no an order because there are consequences when you break law and order. So for me, in spite of all these things and all that, yes, it is bad, yet it should not be repeated, but more importantly, there should be a consequence, a proper investigation and consequences for those who are found to be wanting. So um, as much as we say we should talk about the consequence, but it's also important that we talk about how long this evil and this practice has been going on without anyone noticing. So it feels like we just woke up someday and we realized that... Uh, you know, our pipelines have been tapped. Now, in 2016, the Nigerian Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative alluded that Nigeria recorded as high as crude oil loss from 2016. So 
Why didn't we swing into action? Are we saying that we're not in the know, or, or this is just another pretentious act, you know, by the government of the day? Okay, so when you say we, you know, it's good to clarify what does we mean. Are you, are you talking about security forces? Are you talking about government? So if you are talking about government, are you talking about NNPC or the Ministry of Petroleum or the regulator? Or are you just talking about the We president? as a stakeholder. So, I mean, then, so we're talking about stakeholders now because when we talk about we, well, it's a collective responsibility. is a stakeholder, from, including you and I. We are all stakeholders, but does it, being a stakeholder does not necessarily mean you're in a position to act. So that is why it is important to clarify that definition, I mean, that pronoun in this case, we. The important thing, like I said, yes, this thing has been going on for some for a while. That we'll all agree. How long, we cannot know until a proper investigation is taking place. However, I'm speaking as an engineer now, and as somebody who is familiar with fluid flow, there is no way, if they were, if they were properly, if there was an audit of that thing, for them not to know. In fact, there are too many things that would have allowed them to know. Even normal routine maintenance and picking of the of the pipelines will have and will have um, shown that there were issues. Um, the the extent, the pressure of the fluids when they were coming out will have shown that there were issues and there were leakages. There are a million and one ways in which they will have known. So it is impossible that nobody will have known. However, if they had known. What were they doing about it? Who are the people that knew? When did they start knowing about the issues? You know, so those are things that an investigation can reveal. They're not things that so can I'm, be revealed. I'm asking like, whether yes. that investigation should have been done if you have the uh, Nigerian Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative from 2016 saying that, you know, at the time that we had lost, we recorded the highest loss in terms of crude oil. So, um, we, we, we need to understand that we're in 2022, and we can't just wake up and begin to sound like we don't understand. This report and this, uh, you know, uh, article or whatever, or investigation was made public at the time. That there was superior strength. There was something that was wrong that led to the loss of our crude oil. And so when we, 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 you announced saying, uh, you know, the government, because the government is also saying that we need to have some kind of investigation to understand. This has been made public. You have also said that we're in the know. So exactly what is it that stopped us, you know, from stopping whatever was going on from 2016? Okay, so, so what has been made public now is that there's criminal activities going. But before certain decisions can be made, you need, there's certain other questions need to be need to be clarified in a verifiable manner. The key word here is verifiable. So things like how long this thing has taken place needs to be known. The people that were involved from the beginning, they also need to be known. Those things cannot come out from a native investigation because NATI is an NGO, it's an industry watchdog. These issues that I'm raising, they are criminal in nature. So it will take a license and someone with a statutory responsibility to do that proper investigation. And that is why there's a need for a proper investigation. It is not just for the sake of it. It is so that people can be persecuted. So, and it's so that that persecution of the people who are guilty can serve as a deterrent. It's basically how law and order works. So, that is, and there's no substitute for that. We are grateful for the work that Meiji has done, the starting I mean, things. We are grateful for pointing directions to it, but they can only do so much because they are not, con they are not empowered by law to do those things. So, that is why, in the absence of a proper investigation that is backed by law, either by the legislator, either by the police, or by any other law enforcement agency, we can only be groping in the dark, pointing fingers. That's the best that can happen. So there must be that investigation by law. So, so what happens, you know, with the investigation, especially when you have those who should be investigating, you know, uh, the entire situation being complicit in the investigation? Well, what will be the outcome? Well, well, typically in cases like that, they will do a commission of inquiry. 
we should be empowered by law. Usually, they will get a judge who will now have certain people. So there should be a commission of inquiry. And that commission of inquiry will be given in terms of reference and a time frame. That's basically how those things happen. What we are facing is not totally strange in the world of governance, where you have people, even in developed countries, there are cases where the police force are found to be corrupt and entrenched in criminal activities. There are ways to go about it. So what we are saying is this, that if, we are, if the facts of the matter is pointing to systemic corruption, then there must be a commission of inquiry which can be headed by a judge or an entire judge, somebody independent of the system. And then you get some other people who are knowledgeable about the industry into the system to be able to dissect the technical aspects of it. And then we will produce a report which will usually be submitted to the president, who is the person that will commission. And based on that, then the police and all the people within the justice system can start to prosecute people who are held accountable. That's how it is done. So in all of this, uh, some Nigerians think that, you know, the Ministry of Petroleum Resources and the minister should be held accountable. And we know that uh, President Mohamed Bouhari has occupied that office seven years plus counting. But what are your thoughts? Well, to the extent that the ministry supervises NMPC, they have where they will be held accountable. But so is NMPC, so is the Navy, so is everybody. So basically, you are not going to summarize the... Uh, problems and dump it on the doorsteps of one person. That would be scapegoating. The issue is this. A proper investigation will show if there was an accountant that altered figures. To the extent that that accountant altered figures, he should be held accountable. If there was an engineer that re gave false reports on the fluids that were to come out, that didn't come out, that engineer should be held accountable. If there was a uh, PR person who gave false information to the public to the extent that he broke the law, he should be held accountable. So basically, we cannot do a kind of witch hunting or sweep it under the carpet in this case. Everybody should be made to face the law to the extent to which they broke the law. It is not about blame. This, this no longer, we shouldn't be looking at casting blames that, okay, the, um, the minister is fully responsible, he should take the blame. No, it's not about blaming. It is about people who broke the law being held accountable by the law. That is the way it should go. So, so what becomes of Nigeria now and where, you know, you understand that we are very dependent on oil for our earnings? And with the crisis that's going on in Ukraine and with the fact that we haven't been able to meet our quota and also, on the other hand, there's also, you know, a plan to reduce uh, an output, or which has already been done. And so uh, from the time that we probably would say we're producing 2 million per barrels plus, uh, we have been reduced to producing 1.8 or thereabout. And however, we haven't been able to leave up to you know, that quota that's been allocated to us as a country, producing below 900,000. With all of this, how do we survive? What's the way forward? I mean, first of all, we have uncovered a very big hole, <laughs> which is what these things are. That hole should be blocked. I mean, and that way in itself, we show up. I mean, if they were stealing 500,000 barrels per day, you can do the math. 500,000 barrels per day is not a small amount of... Uh, crude oil, anywhere in this world, and you can do the math. So if you have discovered that, I mean, that is one way in which we will show up the amount of, I mean, our production quota. So it was never really about militants that were still in the creeks. It was never really about uh, pipelines that were being blown. It was just about systemic theft within the NNPC, and that is what has come to the light. So basically... In the past, we were grouping in the dark, trying to uncover and try to know what the issues were behind our low production quota. But whether they were, for whatever issues, those things have come to light now. And um, I mean, I believe that they will be plugged and everybody will be the better for it. But, but how can, they, how can this, uh, you've talked about the holes being blocked. 
how do you block a hole if you don't identify the persons? However, we hear that you know it's uh, top secret for the Minister of Defense, or I mean the Chief of Defense Staff. And so it's, it's not that we, these names cannot be published. It's not that we don't know the people who are involved, but we can't put it out because it's top secret. So how do you go ahead to block all of this when you're not transparent you know, with the entire process? Let's say the discovery, because it feels like we, you know, we threw a magic wand and we're here now. Okay, if I, 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 wasn't, I, I wasn't hearing you clearly, oh, no. but if I got your question, what you were trying to say is that how can we recover this if we are not transparent? So you're talking about the system, am I correct? Yes, exactly. Okay, so when you talk about systems, like a uh, transparent system and all that, so we're talking about how things should function. In a normal in a normal situation, or how to get the situation into normalcy, which will be the result after these criminal investigations is over. So right now we are in a crisis. So you are not yet going to be talking about normalcy where there is a crisis because there has been a discovery of the fact that a significant chunk of our resources is consistently being stolen. So what we need to do is like a patient who maybe he gets constant headache and is dizzy, and as a result, he has had an accident. When he has an accident, the first thing you'll be looking at is to stop areas that are bleeding and all that. It's not to be looking at the cure to dizziness. So when you have recovered it from the emergency, then you can now be looking at the causative factors. What could have been causing this person to have been dizzy? So right now, we have discovered that there's a bleeding of the resources as a result of systemic tests. That bleeding needs to be stopped. So when it is stopped, the system within NMPC to make it accountable so that the people can be, so that they can be transparent and audited can now be put in place. Because putting that system in place now is in the mid-term and long-term. In the short term, it is the test that needs to stop. To so this is just basically how the thing should work or how systems work. So that's the point there. It's okay. Uh, thank you so much, Olapode Show me for being part of the show this morning. We appreciate your thoughts on, and the perspective you've brought on the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. All right, then have a happy holiday. Olapode Shomi is an oil and gas expert in Abuja. And that's the size of our conversation on at the breakfast. Thank you for being with us from 7 o'clock up until this time. If you missed that on any part of it, it will be great for you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're at Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. My name is Messi Eboko. Thank you for staying with us.